Hello and welcome to the Manage Self Lead Others podcast, mainly for experienced and aspiring people managers. I'm your host, Nina Sunday, and this is the show to help you explore ways to become the best version of yourself at work as a manager. Each episode, you'll hear from some of the brightest minds on the planet who share your passion to elevate and transform team culture. They'll share insights in self-leadership and leading others. Together, we can make workplace culture better. Are you ready? Because it's time to manage self and lead others. Thanks for tuning into this episode of Manage Self, Lead Others podcast. I'm your host, Nina Sunday, and we have a world expert in pricing known as the price whisperer. Per Schofers is a thought leader in everything pricing and how companies can use pricing to drive higher growth, sales volume and increased profitability. It was out of his frustration with what business schools teach about pricing, the fact that it was too abstract, too academic, too hard for a business executive to act on, Pear set out to make pricing practical and actionable. Pear Schofers has a deep understanding of how the four P's of marketing, place, price, product and promotion, how the four P's interact and what affects price. I'm looking forward to this deep dive into pricing. Welcome, Pear Schofers. Welcome, Pear. It's uh, really exciting to be talking to you today about a topic that, from my experience, uh, even in my own business, but also working with uh, in other businesses, that people just assume price. They don't really take a scientific approach to it. And I believe you've got a scientific approach to setting prices. So please tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, um, mo- you know most 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 companies and and um, most companies don't really understand the importance of price, and um, because of that, they they don't spend enough resource doing it. And what does that mean? Well, it means that they may be looking at a competitor or they may be uh, simply guessing what the best price would be. Or many manufacturers use uh, cost plus pricing, meaning that they carefully calculate the cost and then they, um, they add some kind of industry margin on, on top of that cost. Now, uh, all of these methods is a guarantee to leave money on the table. And um, leaving money on the table is not a good idea. <laughs> now we need to maximize our profits. And I've worked with sales teams. I've worked with my own salespeople and they're so quick to discount. And mm-hmm. what they don't realize is that anytime you discount, it's actually a hundred percent of that discount is comes off profit. Correct. Correct. That's something salespeople don't understand. And sometimes sales managers as well, because they're, they're focusing on let's get the figures up. You know, it's it's gross profit margin that really is important, isn't that right? There, yeah, there. I mean, there there's a sort of a saying or a proverb here saying that the the um, um, nobody cares whether your company is profitable or not, but if your market share drops with half a percent, heads will roll. Right. Which is crazy. <laughs> yes. Yes. So that so that people are looking at the wrong statistic. They're measuring the wrong thing. They many do, and and um, and 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 you go to negotiation. Salespeople go to negotiation training, and and that is about how to discount. But there is a, there is another interesting statistic. So when we just talk about that, um, purchase managers typically go on on negotiation training every six months. Salespeople go on sales training maybe every ten years. Guess who got the upper hand? Training themselves by reading up on their on their uh, <laughs> on their uh, profession. Uh, yeah, well, by, yeah. So it's funny how sales sales. It's my favorite co- comment is that salespeople need to consider their career as a profession. Therefore, continuing professional development is so important. Yeah. Oh, it's important. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's important in in all aspects of of of, of a company, of course, but uh, it's particularly important when um for, for for those who who actually create the lifeblood of every company 
which is sales. Yes. And and that is so funny. I I um I'm also I'm 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 mentoring uh, startups among other things I I do, and. <clears throat> And, and, and one of the things and one of the most frustrating things I hear sometimes is the, the startups who's in the, in, in, the, in the mode of, no, we just need to refine that feature. Oh, we just need another, you know, we just need to, 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 to fix our website or no, um, I think our logo needs to change. No, you need to go out and sell. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, a lot of people. A lot of people think marketing will do everything, but you've got to have a sales process as well. You're absolutely yeah. right. And and here's the thing: getting back to uh, profitability in sales. Um, if if salespeople understood or were encouraged to understand the gross profit margin of different products and were rewarded for selling the more profitable product, that would be a, a better way to approach things. Would that be right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a um, there's there's some interesting statistics here, and and I'm going to um, lean on on two different studies. One that is uh, done by um, McKinsey, uh, the large consulting firm, and the other um, by A.T. Kearney, a slightly smaller large consulting firm. And in both cases, what they did, one of them looked at um, uh, the S&P 500 and the other the Fortune 2000s. And, and what they did was that they, 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 at the end of the day, profits in a company comes from only three variables. Yeah. It's, it's your total cost, it is your total sales, and it's whatever you, price you sell that at. And so they looked at all these companies that could be said to be an average American company. Um, and, and they found um, they they found the same answers, meaning that, um, um, and they I call this the one percent challenge. And they looked at how if we change one of these three variables, the cost, um, the sales volume, and the price with one percent, what will happen to profitability? Well, it was found that if if, if you can reduce your cost with 1%, profitability goes up with 3.5%. If you can increase your sales with 1%, profitability goes up on the average 4.5%. But if you can increase your price with 1% or reduce your discount with 1%, profitability goes up with 11.3%. Now that is a interesting statistic, and just just to give myself confidence, some years ago I used to have a chart behind my desk that it was some marketing expert had uh, printed that said, you know, increase your prices by ten percent, increase a, a experience a thirty percent increase in profit, increase it by fifty percent, and and so on. It went up, so it made because sometimes um, sales. Uh, or, or companies set their prices with an element of fear. It's like, if we increase the prices, we'll chase all our customers away. Yeah. Maybe they'll just chase the wrong customers away. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's very, I mean, two things here that, that uh, you, you spur my thinking. Um, first off, I, um, I've actually made a calculator. So if you're in a, in, in a company, you put in your you put in your, your, your cost, you put in your revenue, and then you put in the, the amount of um, price increase you are going to, to do, 1%, 5%, whatever. And as a result, you see how much your profitability is gonna go up. A story here about how price um, affects your, 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 um, uh, your, your customers. Tell us the um, story. <laughs> yeah, we, we did this for a, um, a fairly small company here in, in the Los Angeles area um, that sold a, or self still sells, a, um, a, a phone system in the cloud, a business phone system in the cloud. Wow. And we said that you guys are so underpriced that you can quadruple your price. Right. All right, which they did. And the result of that was two things. First off, um, they, um, uh, their sales volume increased with 25% at four times the prices. Uh, 
Right. Secondly, um, to use the very technical term the, the CEO used, he said, and then we got rid of the bottom feeders and we got a completely different set of customers. So he said, our support costs have gone down with 80%. In other words, the problematic, troublesome uh, customers that took up all your time, which eats up your profitability, they went away. Yeah. And then you had the, the high profit, low maintenance uh, customers that stayed. Oh, that's wonderful. Absolutely. But, you know, this is because when you, when, you, when you have these really low prices, in many, many cases, you only, well, I say you, but the company, um, appeals to price sensitive customers and price sensitive customers buy from the company only because of the low price. They're not all that interested in the product or service. So they, they, they don't even spend or invest the time needed to learn how to use it. You're absolutely it's right. And they the don't appreciate cost. if you go, if you go the extra mile, they're not appreciating yep. that difference. They just assume, you know, that's, yeah, that's the correct. Yeah. 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 So price optimization is is a topic or a theme that should be on any manager's uh, list of, uh, fo you know, where to focus. Is that right? Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and it is on the minds of people. But um, <laughs> nine, I mean, we actually did a study on this and I know other people have done similar studies. And uh, going back to um, those three variables and how it affects profitability. We've, we've done a, a, a study of, of, of American CEOs where we simply asked the, the, the question, which of these three variables affects profitability the most? And 12% said price. Right. 88% said the wrong answer. What was the wrong answer? <laughs> Well, the wrong answer was what affects price the most. They said, well, sales volume. Oh. Uh, sorry, profitability the most. And they said sales volume or cost cutting. Yes, yes, because I think people think that if they drop the price, they'll get more volume, therefore they'll get more profit. But that's a false false thinking, isn't it? Yeah, and, and, and setting, setting different prices is something, I mean, every company spends oodle of resource for cost control and sales and marketing. And then they spend almost no, no resource on pricing. And, and I, I think about this a lot, Pear, because if I've ever gone for volume and dropped the price, I mean, mm -hmm. I've been in business 20 years, so I've experimented myself, not perhaps as scientifically as you. I've noticed that we've worked twice as half for half the, half the income. I, I have similar experience. <laughs> And I'm over that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, uh, and, and it's, um, um, we, we, um, we, we, we're currently working with a, a company who's selling supplements. And I mean, we work, this is one of many customers we have, but this company is selling supplements. And they say, the problem we have is that the, the raw material is in our supplement is expensive. And then he, they said, we have been told that we should take our cost and we should take that times five and that's going to be our price. But that's too expensive. Right. <laughs> so, so, then, so then the whole point in, um, for, for us to be involved is to understand um, what, for, for the, this is a unique product, what... Um, customers are really um, willing to pay those relatively high prices? What is the profile of customers that will pay the price that is five times the, the, um, um, the, the, uh, uh, the cost of the product? Um, <clears throat> what marketing messages appeal to these people? What channels do they want to learn about the product? How do they want to buy the product? Do they want to buy it one off, or do they want to buy a subscription? Do they want to buy it brick and mortar? Do they want to buy it from um, the company's own website or from Amazon? All this. So it's because uh, the company has this 
bug in their head that it has to be five times cost, which is okay. Um, but then someone gave them that formula once, did they? Yes. Formula, <laughs> someone gave some exactly. So then the question is, how do you defend that? How do you find the market niche that are willing to pay five times the cost? And how do you market to that customer category so that they are willing to pay five times the cost? What specific features, functions, and benefits um, leads to the pricing power of this company so they can charge five times the cost? It's all about product differentiation and communicating that unique selling proposition exactly. to the potential customer. Few companies realize that it's actually profit that fuels the company. They forget, don't they? Yeah, they do. They forget, yes. So then that's why they focus on sales volume. And you, you mentioned that that um, salespeople could be, should be, uh, they should be compensated on profitability. Not on, not on revenue. And some industries are. I had one uh, salesperson uh, join our company and she had a conversation with me about what's the gross profit margin of this product mm -hmm. versus that profit. I went, gee, I'm not used to having that sort of conversation with <laughs> my salesperson, but she'd come from a recruitment firm where uh -huh. that was really ingrained and I really yeah. thanked her for that. That was marvellous. That's we great. Changed our, changed our approach uh, after that. So... I guess um, what 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 really what really is the biggest mistake that companies make when setting prices? It's like you said, it doesn't feel like the right price, or like that's that's like intuition, or they're basing it on they're comparing themselves to other products, but maybe they're not realizing how unique they are, and that's yes. the story they should be telling the market. I mean. How do stop losses work on Kraken? Let's say I have a birthday party on Wednesday night, but an important meeting Thursday morning. So sensible me pre-books a taxi for 10 p.m. with alerts. Voila, I won't be getting carried away and staying out till two. That's stop loss orders on Kraken, an easy way to plan ahead. Go to kraken.com and see what crypto can be. Not investment advice. Crypto trading involves risk of loss. Cryptocurrency services are provided to U.S. and U.S. territory customers by Payward Interactive Inc., PWI, DBA Kraken. View PWI's disclosures at kraken.com slash legal slash disclosures. Customers come to or companies come to me and they say things like, um, we haven't dared to change our prices for seven years. And I'm convinced, they say, that if we just and, and, and if we just increase our prices with with two percent, we're gonna lose the entire business. You know? Oh. So um, maybe the biggest mistake is that companies in general are so afraid of pricing, so afraid of, of increasing prices that, that they, they, they almost suicidal in their, in their approach to pricing, you know? It sounds like um, they're driven by fear. Yeah, exactly. That's no way to run a company. <laughs> that is no way to run a company. Now, obviously, they're, they're outliers. There are some companies that are very good. And uh, on <clears throat> on on pricing in general, and and on on the process in the company, but um, the, the the biggest mistake is having that fear of pricing and not realizing that pricing, in fact, is a profitability driver, and um, it's not unusual at all. Like the story I mentioned with the um, uh, with a telecom telephone company in the cloud. It's not unusual at all to increase prices and see a um, increase in sales. Yeah, that's so counterintuitive, isn't it? And what mm. a lovely story. So we should take heart with that. And of course, any company you work with, you encourage their confidence that because uh, you use a process called predictive demand analysis. Yes. It sounds very scientific. Can you tell us about that? <laughs> yeah, the, the, it's um, well, let me just tell you a little bit about my background before, because it yes, all please. comes from, from that. And, and I had a chance to, to run a couple of companies in Europe before I moved here to Los Angeles and, and, and then been uh, running a couple of companies here in the States, too. And, and we did experiments with pricing. And some of those experiments were very successful type um, next quarter revenues are up with 25%. And others were complete disasters. Um, what I had learned in business school and can read about pricing was so academic that it was completely useless in terms of us understanding why some of these experiments worked and others didn't. 
So um, 14 years ago, um, when I decided I was too old and too opinionated to work within the reporting structure, I, um, I decided to take that interest in pricing and develop a process that would make um, every pricing experiment a success. And <clears throat> that process uh, co consists of, of, and this is where we get into the predicted sales uh, assessment. The, the, um, it, it consists of a particular kind of market research, um, online market research, um, where we, from where we can predict sales volume and revenue at different price levels. And, and, and then we take that predictions and we split it, we segment it. So we segment it by different customer profiles, for example. So we can tell our client, this is the customer profile you should focus on because it will lead to the highest revenue. Ah, uh, they call that the sweet spot. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got but, to focus but, on the sweet spot. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then we take that further and further and we say, these are the marketing messages that leads to the highest revenue. These are the product or service features that leads to the highest revenue. These are the sales channels that leads to the highest revenue. So you actually have a, a whole uh, a holistic approach. Yes, Not absolutely. just about what price will people buy, but you actually give advice on the, the specific messages to appeal to the demographic that's going to be willing to pay that price. Yes. Well, it sounds like you earn your keep when, somebody, <laughs> when you work with people. Well, you know, I have to tell you this, we've done maybe half a dozen projects in Australia. So. Oh, that's interesting. Very yeah. interesting. So some, um, of the, some of the more well-known brands over there. So you, you work with with people all around the world, Europe, oh, Australia, yeah. USA. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. And that's also interesting. Um, we we um, we did a, a a project a couple of um, well maybe two months ago for for a, a Scottish based company uh, or a, you know company based in Scotland and they were selling uh, its product in the UK and here in the US or well, they were launching a new product I should say and um, for this particular product we found that. Um, um, the, 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 the feature of the product that drove the highest revenue in the UK was lightweight, whereas um, lightweight was not important at all in the US. And then we realized why. And that is because as you, this is a product that you bring with you when you travel. Um, and in the UK, that travel would typically be on public transport which is why weight is very important. Oh. Whereas travel here in the US, you put this device in your trunk and nobody cares about the, the, the weight because you only, you only um, um, carry it for, for, you know, maybe not more than 100 meters, you know? Well, that's a cultural yeah. difference between those two geographies. And that's yeah. very interesting to discover that. And of yeah. course, um, what, how are you doing that through focus groups or surveys? No, we do, no online online surveys and yeah. and we um, be, be, when when I started uh, started the company then fourteen years ago I had I didn't know anything about market research so we do it completely different because I I didn't know what you're not supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, that helps because then you innovate. <laughs> yeah, correct. Yeah, so. <laughs> Um, and of course, we and we we de actually developed our own um, artificial intelligence software to um, uh, to to analyze the data that we capture in these surveys. So now, one of the things that um, uh, you've written about is price anchoring, mm -hmm. and also ending the uh, the price with an odd number like a nine or a seven, as opposed yeah. to rounding it off. And I think there's a point at which lower priced items might work that way but there's when you when you're working in the premium pricing area that works against you can you tell yeah. us about that yeah the the uh, price anchoring works actually in 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 all price levels though right. and and that has to do with how we as humans um react to to numbers when we see um uh, multiple numbers the first number we see 
is is becomes an anchor for the second number and so forth. And um, that means, for example, that if you do a website where you have multiple product offerings as sort of a good, better, best, you should actually start with to the left having the most expensive offer because that would make the, yes. the, the, the offers that are sort of to the right um, appear more affordable. Yes, so there should always, be, yes, I've heard this, there should always be three offerings. Uh, you expect that they might go with the middle one, but always yes. have a high priced one that's presented first. Yes, yeah. always first. Now, there, when we talk about websites, there are other things you should, if you can, sometimes it's, it's you, you don't, you can't, but sometimes uh, if you can, you should remove the dollar sign or make it as small as you can. Well, I, I, I know to remove the comma. Yeah, you should remove the comma as well. <laughs> but, and also get don't add the dot zero zero at the end. Right. Get rid of that. But yeah. remove the dollar sign. I hadn't thought yeah. of that. Because then it's a number. It's not money. Oh, that is fantastic. <laughs> I'm going to do that from now on. <laughs> you know? or, or, or make the dollar sign as small as you can because there may be a regulatory... Uh, yeah, requirements yeah. to have a dollar sign, you yeah. know. Uh -huh. um, so what other little tips like that in terms of, <laughs> <laughs> and you should also make sure that um, when uh, when people are so people are reading the description, and then um, you know you after that you have your 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 uh, um, prices and so forth, and add some big number, used by three hundred fifty million people. That's another big number makes the prices oh, just another big number there makes the price seem less oh that is such a good little and, and 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 i'll tell you the the this the most brilliant way of price anchoring i have seen was when apple came out with the apple watch because the regular apple watch was 349 dollars here in the us okay. and then they had an a version for $17,000. And it was exactly the same watch with one exception, that the case was made of gold. The case was made of gold. Oh. And the did they sell many of those? No, I don't think so. But what happened was that um, every journalist who wrote this, and of course, any potential buyer of an Apple Watch wrote these reviews and stuff like that. But all the journalists wrote about the audacity to have a $17,000 product, which is identical to a 349. And that 349, every time you wrote, read about it, got less, uh, less and less expensive, more and more affordable. Right. You know? And you can do now, it verbally too. I remember when, uh, when we had public courses for speed reading, uh, we'd say, well, it's $995, but if you want the early bird, it's only... 795. Yeah, so exactly. It sounds less by comparison. Yeah. Now, it's, but, but going to another thing here then, um, note that it's 17,000, not 16,999. That's an interesting point. So, because, because with, if you, if you, product or services where you want to use price to message quality, uniqueness, and so forth, should not end on a nine or a seven. They should, they should end on, 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 on even numbers. I, I promise I will start testing that, uh, that method and I will report back to you, Pia. I, I, can, I can assure you it's going to work. Thank you. But I think that's been the, the, a really good point to end our conversation today. But before we go, is there any one final uh, piece of advice you want to share with our listeners? Um, well, we talked about many different things here, but I, 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 I think maybe the, the, the most important thing is don't be afraid of price increases. And some companies stay too long with the old price and don't yeah. don't acclimatize acclimatize their uh, their customers to regular price rises. Yeah, exactly. This is something you should always do. Mm. Every every six months, every year, you should um, 
increase your prices with a little bit, 3%, 5%. Nobody's going to care. Nobody's going to notice. But after a while, this is going to make a huge impact on, on, on your profitability. That's right. Well, um, Pierre, how, how can people find you? And how can pe- do you have a, any sort of a blog or, or newsletter that people can subscribe to? Well, I, I do. I'm, I'm, I'm actually just last week uh, got a publisher for my book. Um, and um, so that's going to be distributed by Simon & Schuster um, in probably February next year. Are you allowed um, to tell us the title or is it top secret? We don't know the title just yet. But I um, do know they call you the price whisperer. I am the price. I'm supposed <laughs> to be. And this is not something I invented, to be honest. I was just people called me the price whisperer so many times that I decided, hey, why not? Why don't I just adopt it? Uh, exactly, um, exactly. But the best way to find me, are, of course, is the website, uh, showforce.com. Weird name, makes perfect sense if you're Swedish like me. Uh, so it's sjofors.com. And it'll be in the show notes so they can read about yeah. it. Yeah. And um, and there's a, there's a page there with... Um, uh, lots of lots of links to articles and interviews and 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 blog posts and so forth. That, yes, uh, they go to the with. thought leadership page, and there's a yes. wealth of uh, information there. And I I really thank you, Pear, because what you're doing is unique, and you're actually uh, you're actually focusing on a, on an area that that people just assume have all mm-hmm. these assumptions about, and you're actually stirring it stirring the pot and saying, hey, hang on. There's actually other ways to look at this and uh, you're educating uh, the market. So fantastic. Well well done. Fantastic work you're doing. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for having me on the show, Nina. And and I hope this was um, useful and and also a little entertaining. Oh, it was both. Thank you so much, Pear. Lovely to talk with you today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nina. Today, we've been speaking with Pear Chauffeurs on the Manage Self, Lead Others podcast. He can be reached at chauffeurs.com. You can find the link in the show notes. I'm your host, Nina Sunday. Remember to subscribe and listen to Manage Self Lead Others wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, ciao for now. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com. Thank you.